And that's primarily because one of my roommates when I moved to Delhi to be a journalist was a lawyer who fled Hyderabad and reached Delhi. And I don't want to take his name because he was sort of a, a political escape for him. He was a senior lawyer here and I was looking for a roommate in Delhi. And somebody said there is a uh, as an early 20s person and if you are moving to a city like Delhi, uh, you tend to end up in a certain kind of neighborhood in Delhi and certain kind of roommates you tend to get. But here was somebody who was 30 years older to you and who was very hesitant in saying his name uh, and his background. But over the years, over the, sorry, over the months, we started sort of getting to know each other well and he introduced me to his life story, why he fled Hyderabad then. This is 2001 or two. He was fleeing the city for a character by name Naimuddin, who was very notorious in this city um, for the kind of uh, repression that the city was going through. Uh, I think human rights uh, space writing space generally faced a lot of turmoil in the early 2000s. But Naimuddin still was sort of a unrelated, un unrelated character to my journalism then because you know this was some local guy in the city of Hyderabad for a journalist who is practicing in Delhi until I started noticing a series of events which started following thereafter and with most of those stories I had a role to play either as an editor or somebody who kind of supervised investigations, um, which is the, the fake encounter of Swarabuddin, who uh, then Kausarbi and Tulsi Ram Prajapati most recently of Judge Loya because all those deaths had a role and a connection to Naimuddin. So Rabuddin was working for Naimuddin or was connected to Naimuddin. And when a home minister was killed in Gujarat, so Rabuddin and Kausarbi, who were traveling from Hyderabad later, were picked up, were kept in illegal custody, were tortured and killed in faint encounter. Kausarbi's body was found cut into several pieces in different parts of North, North India. Then Prajapati, who was the only witness of their abduction, he gets killed the year after, the only witness to the event. He gets killed the year after. And I thought those stories ended there, right? You know, 2006 then. But 2017, a pile of paper will land upon my desk, which looked like a script for a Bollywood movie. It wasn't very coherently written, but I knew there was something in it. Uh, a senior journalist friend had introduced somebody was going to come with some papers, and his number was left. I contacted him. This was before people started using Signal. This was before not many people were even using WhatsApp. And the journalist who I ended up speaking was uh, Niranjan Takle, who was then a reporter for the Week magazine in Maharashtra. So Niranjan said, look, the judge, the CBI special court judge, who was hearing the Sorabuddin fake encounter case, 
actually his death, what was then until then was said, seen as a heart attack, was something else. Now, what was that something else? That was what the story was. And the draft also had details of the Chief Justice of Bombay High Court then, Mohit Shah, offering a 100 crore bribe to Judge Lawyer for a favorable judgment acquitting Amit Shah. So this all looked like, oh my god, a roommate in year 2102, Naimuddin would get properly introduced to me as a character who would harbor people like Sorabuddin, who would then get used by politicians from time to time. There are people who are available on rent or on assignment. Anyway, the judge lawyer story, as you would know, of course, became a series of stories. 30 stories or so, unprecedented in Indian journalism as a follow-up to one single story. It also led to initiating the impeachment process of uh, Chief Justice in India for the first time, even though the impeachment process did not succeed in itself for the lack of uh, numbers in parliament. But as a journalist, one always knew, and I think I connected to Hyderabad to know how decayed the system in India was, pretty much in many sense, in, in allowing people like Naimuddin to flourish and be playing an important role in a place so that a lawyer from an underprivileged Dalit background, first generation learner, had to flee the city because of the kind of uh, loyally work that he would do and be afraid of every knock on the door and there were days that he would send me to check whether it's one of those Naimuddin's men who is coming and he would, you know, roll himself under the, under the, under the bed. I was prepared with the script that there wasn't anybody who stays here and the decay of that system of what looked like a Vajpayee government then and the decay of a system which would then see even with the left and the regional party support you would have a congress rule 10 years where justice could still not be done in fake encounter cases and riot cases and so forth to the decay who which we are seeing now which is at a different level altogether where institutions could just be destroyed, the country can be changed into something else altogether. So, it, it raises the question, who takes, who, who rather took most out of the decay in the Indian system? And that answer is pretty simple. Who took, who, who got the most out of the decay in the Indian system is undoubtedly Hindu politic, uh, political Hinduism or what we know as Hindutva and this is a political force which in the first general election in the form of Jansang had only three percentage of votes and look at 2019 they've grown into 37 percentage of votes in this country and it's not just the vote percentage that when you think how the country has changed got transformed into a different country of course, there was this promise of a modern, secular world. And I remember cl this very clearly growing up in a place called Wayanad in Kerala, quite cut off from the urban areas in, in Kerala. I had a school teacher who used to say that the idea of India was to create a brown man's enlightened world. And that used to be very romantic. Here is somebody who kind of grew out of that freedom movement literature and the vision and the idea of India. And, and, and as a student who was sitting in the class, I was wondering, do I get to play a role in that brown man's enlightened world? So if you go to play that role, you study well, you get out of the place and do something, do something meaningful for the society, right? So I think the path which looked seemingly attractive to me was being a journalist and of course you would see the decay in the system as, as I said but the time that we are living in sometimes sort of makes us worry that will we even have the space to take the conversation back to a time that we were used to or felt comfortable or have we made Kashmir out of every Indian state where journalists can get booked or killed? 
Gauri Lengesh, with whom I traveled a lot and reported many stories, she was shot dead. And just a few days before she was shot dead, we were speaking on the phone. And it, and it just sort of shocks you in a way that uh, that can't be explained in many sense, right? People who you are speaking to one day, are, they are, you know, later in jail. I was booked in 10 sedition cases now, you know, in some sense, you know, it's a person who is booked in sedition cases who, is, who you are listening to, so it can make you equally party to the same crime. But this is the kind of cases that when you would grow up, you thought that this was the colonial rule, colonial era, colonizer has slapped against Gandhi and Nehru, but now all of us, any of us, can easily be booked in these things because they, these rules existed in our law books, the 19th century rules, Official Secret Act, again another set of rules that all journalists who want to do any cutting edge work always get scared of. Uh, the Supreme Court said the kind of documents that journalists like uh, caravan journalists possessed would amount to being booked under Official Secret Act. What were these? These were trade documents of Rafale fighter jets. But this is, this is the kind of attorney, I mean, this is the kind of top legal officer who would stand up in the Supreme Court and say that, you know, this merits to be, uh, uh, this merits for an official secret act case. And that's 120 years old. The British had a purpose to have them. Maybe an independent country also has, I don't know, that's debatable. But the time that we are living in, we see institution after institution. Media as an institution anyway in, in this country was very vulnerable and the signs of that was visible early on. But many people thought it was the vulnerability only from the market that an advertiser would decide what will go when, where, how. Like half of the, uh, I was surprised to see the Times of India uh, Hyderabad edition paper, uh, lots of sheets in it, like in Delhi I don't think it's that many, so that means the advertising market here is doing pretty well reasonably. Maybe it's half of it is uh, um, or movie ads or what not, but you have, you have headlines running on top that these are all paid pages. So you can actually book spaces for paid news and this has been there for like 20 years, so we, knew, we all knew this. But we also see political news getting into spaces because this is what a large advertiser would demand. And if the advertiser is a ruling party or if the advertiser is government itself, what does that say about the journalistic freedom of those newspapers? And even in the judge lawyer story or a file scam or even the farmers protest, I mean the sedition cases were slapped against us on the farmers protest. We could see in the commentary pages to just on the spot reporting of what happens then and there on the ground. Even there, there is a kind of screening and censoring that makes us worry that, you know, this, we are living in a totalitarian country. And journalism school, every journalist is taught that, you know, f freedom of press works in three kinds of systems, libertarian, totalitarian, and uh, sort of social, socially free, democratically free kind of uh, models or democracies. I always thought that India was in the third category, but increasingly you believe that there is a combination of totalitarianism and libertarianism which has taken over and given us a different kind of an ecosystem for media to operate. So that's about media as an institution. Judiciary, if you come to that, I remember this conversation with my colleagues in caravan in 2016 or 17, 16, that you know, it has been a while that we did a positive story on something. So let's look at the Chief Justice of Supreme Court who, seemed to, who, who then was doing some good work, seemingly. Justice Keher, he was part of a judgment. He was going to be the first uh, Sikh Chief Minister, uh, sorry, Chief Justice. Uh, he was part of a judgment where he said the appointment of judges would be done by judges themselves. This is when Prime Minister Modi was pushing for appointments to be an executive decision. 
So that looked like a slap on the government in 2016. And for a Supreme Court Chief Justice to do that, and he was only going to be the Chief Justice after this decision, we thought, okay, there's going to be some interesting positive story from this man's strength and courage. But three months later, the reporter came back to office and he told us, you know, we're not sorry to disappoint you. I'm seeing not all that positive things here. I said, what's it? So he then brought, until then I think it was sort of breaking also at the same time because a long form story takes a while. But a story very quickly appeared, started appearing in paper, uh, in, in blogs, because Prashant Bhushan had taken that issue up in the Supreme Court. And this was a suicide note of a former chief minister of an Indian state. And his wife filed, had filed a case or asked the Supreme Court to take cognizance of it. And what did the letter say? The letter said that two Supreme Court judges asked for 30 lakh bribe for a favorable judgment. So from then onwards, I think our saga of judiciary and then we, are, we were quite worried as journalists, often we are told that you can do any kind of stories in India, but don't touch judiciary. If you touch judiciary, you will be booked in condemned of court. And of course we were worried, we were wondering what does this mean? Uh, we, can we not cover Supreme Court critically when we are in Delhi and we are seeing all kinds of things that we are seeing? We took the decision to proceed with that. And as fate would have it, I think that had prepared for us for a series of Supreme Court judges' tenureship, which came after that. Deepak Mishra, Tenjin Gogoi, uh, Bob Day. And in between, we had uh, uh, Judge Loya and Raphael kind of stories too. All this brings to this mute question. Where is India standing now and what does it mean for people like us who probably prefer to stay in this country or want to live in a country which where the promise probably would have been as romantic or somewhere closer to that of what the school teacher told me the brown man's enlightened world what does it mean to science and scientists the latest caravan cover stories on Modi's doctors and it's a very sad story I don't think any story has made me this sad in the recent times it's about four credible doctors who get appointed in top positions and the kind of decisions that they end up taking when they are in a position of power. People who are recommending or part of a system which is recommending Sharag Samhida Oath to be replacing Hippocratic Oath where the doctors will have to not treat anybody who criticize the government or criticize the king or the king and the kingdom will choose who will get treatment and who will not get treatment. Very regressive things in terms of treatment for people of caste, people uh, 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 for uh, handicapped people, for women. Now we, we have people who are suggesting this as the new Indian oath for medical science, right? And these are people now, this is a system that has been created over the years, but this is getting stretched to a point where we, it's not very different from many theocratic, autocratic states that we have learned in history. Many people thought that over the years, what will fix a majoritarian theocratic state would be identity politics. Political parties based on caste groups, caste politics would throw up political alternatives, or mainstream national parties would become caste aware and will start including diverse and depressed Indians into their narratives and selling the dreams that they have. Parties like Bahujan Samajwadi Party, for example, has emerged out of this promise and the space that it, it, it kind of opened up. But where many of those parties are today also points to a sad story of where that alternative is also has reached and has rather failed in many sense. We see the same caste 
narrative which has given strength to a particular dominant caste in that community is used against the depressed people and the way they have done i think the best example is the recent election which got concluded uttar pradesh if we study the state of uttar pradesh there's a brilliant piece that you know caravan journalist sunil kashyap has published and he comes from a very diverse background and the kind of diversity that is giving him what actually happens in the on the ground as opposed to many journalists who tend to cover and and pontificate on a state like uttar pradesh from their living rooms in south delhi often you think let's say a party like samajwadi party would have a formula worked out between yadavs and muslims and that would pose a certain kind of alternative to the bjp you often think or you are made to believe through your narratives a caste group like jatav will get more scheduled caste groups around it and formulate a challenge to the dominant ideology but how the rss has gained identity politics is a very interesting political science case study in itself they have gone caste by caste in the obc and the sc categories and identified who is suffering because there is a dominant sc or where there is a dominant obc yes and he has rallied everyone underneath this two percentage three percentage what groups in each or lower obc and lower sc and made a huge political vote bank with that so you will have nishads who would be three percentage kashyaps who would be two percentage every each community has been approached and they've given representation now this is in some sense the failure of the dominant caste groups in this narrative right when bsp goes with the jata votes just as that identity politics gives courage and hope and strength to a jadav man or woman to stand up and speak a politics with courage and address a social justice issue with courage with an upper caste he or she is treating a caste below them in the same way the same thing that empowers a yadav man or a woman in negotiating the social relationship with a caste above them they invariably use the same thing to the other backward classes below them this is where the failure of identity politics to me stands that you use it as a currency for your own voice which there is nothing wrong in that that's only 50% of the game but if the other 50% has not been factored in that you that it also leaves you with a responsibility not to transfer the same relationship that you are facing to the caste below you so the class politics historically has failed us in addressing caste issue in this country and caste politics has historically in some sense reminds us that it needs improvement in making it open to include everyone and everyone who they are supposed to empower and there is a difference i think in the way let's say a word like bahujan or mulwasi as you know historically when you follow this narrative is sort of used in practical terms when kanchiram took when he resigned from drdo and then took out uh, you know this mission to organize the oppressed indians his definition was very broad i was reading some of the earlier pamphlet that he had produced and he had made a vertical map showing i mean following basically the manusmriti gradation of the society varna system and he used the 1911 census the last caste census census that the subcontinent had to see what community or what varna system produces how many people right and the privileged indians come to about less than 15 percentage and 85 percent to kanchiram was the bahujan community so it included all the religious minorities it included what we call the obc communities and the sc the st everyone 
and he took out a cycle rally for 40,000 kilometers moving around in most of North India in the 70s and 80s. Finally, you know, UP was the state that they tasted some success. Mayavadi would become the first Dalit woman chief minister, the youngest chief minister the state had seen. So many good things working for them, for her. But where she has ended up or how she has compromised that narrative is a case study as far as BSP is concerned. So you take any political movement in this country, you see the same patterns in SP, you see the same patterns in RLD. So the political question alternative, I think, certainly is an area that there needs to be more clarity in the years to come to see who will pose a threat to a theocratic, autocratic, majoritarian state. Democracy, I think as we all know it, was what gave an equal opportunity for the citizens of this country. Many of those people who have voted for the BJP, let's say, in this election, have done so because, as we saw, maybe there was a dignity which was given to them. When a caste group who has been traditionally been porters and never got a ticket, or people who in, in North, I've seen a lot of people moving around with huge magnets near the garbage and they collect loha or any, any, kind, any form of iron and they sell it further in another market. Now these are traditionally being gypsies, considered as gypsies and no traditional parties have seen them as a politically big enough group. But the meticulous working of artists in some sense they have decided to give tickets to communities which are marginally, marginalized traditionally. So it gives an impression to us, many of us, that people who model themselves after the fascists in Europe, people who presented themselves as far beyond a political party but has called themselves a civilizational force or party with a civilizational goal in mind, I'm talking about the RSS, they have conquered the country's institutions or influenced them if not conquered all the time or parked themselves in a place where an independent officer or a journalist or a judge will always be afraid of the repercussion that it would cause. Either of these three, they've managed to game the system institutions that way or they have gained the pol possible political alternatives which could have come their way, which is identity politics in its silos or identity politics which could, which could make coalitions. What still gives me hope, and I, I think I'm really hopeful that this would change in some time, but I'm not in any, living in an illusion that this would happen anytime soon. It would take many years in my reading. It would take the sacrifices of many people. But I still hope what will change this country is still its <coughs> diversity and the growing income disparity and everything else that comes as a reaction, as a possible reaction to the making of a theocratic, majoritarian, authoritarian state. How we get there? What will it take for us to get there? How will coalitions get built? What kind of leadership will the country throw up? I'm also convinced the kind of current leadership that the country has doesn't give much hope for the kind of social transformation that India requires. Often they jump from one election to the other, so their thinking and training has been around elections. Most of them have been traditionally not been building movements. They have been, they think that they're born to govern or they have been building that attitude. I'm not necessarily speaking about the Gandhi family. The attitude for many, even the local leaders for many, is to rule. They have no idea. They have not been part of protests and formed those protest movements. They don't have the history. They, they don't have the DNA. But that's where I think, as a country, as a people, we we have to see how a, a second kind of leadership, a different kind of definition of leadership 
is required in this country. And I think that's a kind of leadership which doesn't only talk and represent a set of people and talk to a larger audience or talk to people in power. That to me, I think, is only looks like 50% of the work. That leadership should also be the people who will talk back to their communities. We don't necessarily get anywhere, I don't think we will get anywhere if there is a Jadav leader who only represents Jadav. But there should be a Jadav leader who will turn back and tell Jadav community that caste below them, you have to treat them as equals. We need Yadav leaders who will, while representing Yadav community, will have to talk back and tell the Yadav community members that they cannot treat uh, a Jadav or somebody else like the way they are traditionally used to. Political ideologies cannot be currencies. I think we see that, I think, you know, I mean, that's where the sad picture would emerge. Most of the identity politics, whether it's feminism or caste-based identities or any of it, I think primarily the first reason why they exist for me is for dignity and equality and equal recognition with a fellow human being. I think that's where we cannot be parochial, we cannot be limited in our thinking, we cannot see, we, we should rather see it as a, as a way to take us from point A to point B. And I think a country as complex as India would certainly offer that because this is in, in some sense the debate that we are going through is exactly the debate 100 years ago this time this country witnessed. In early 1920s, a very raging debate was going on in the soil. And that was, what kind of an India will we build? It was certain with Government of India acts, and one after other it was coming. In due course, the British would leave. So what kind of a country would we build? Of course, there were massive differences of opinion between Gandhi, Nehru, and Ambedkar. And it was very evident in 1920s. Cotton more evident in the 1930s. But all of them had agreed on one thing, which was a recognition that this was a diverse set of people in the subcontinent, and it has to be a contractual nationalism. A nationalism where people who are trained to think in a certain way, people who have groomed with a certain kind of eating habits, who dress up in a different way, all deciding to coming together as a people and coexisting together. When they were signing up for contractual nationalism, they were actually f following the same debate that was happening in Europe at that point. There was England and France more or less agreeing on contractual nationalism. But you had Germany and Italy and prominent thinkers at that point in those countries. Not so much in Germany in the 20s, but it was emerging there. But Italy certainly it was it most only was in power by 22, 100 years ago this time. And they said that it has to be a majoritarian nationalism, that a nationhood has to be based on the idea of majority people. And India, the same debate in India then. After Savarka apologized, he gets released. He first, British still did not trust him, so they put him in house arrest. They brought him from Andamans. They put him in house arrest in Ratnagiri, where he wrote a thesis, we don't know either exactly it was with the British knowing or nudging, but he wrote a thesis, the book Hindutva, which then challenged the coming together of Muslims and Hindus in early 1920s with Khilafat and so forth. So it put Gandhi and Congress in place, at least intellectually, that there is a challenge in form of, by form of a thesis, by form of a vision for the country. And 24, Savaka, when he proposed this new vision for India, articulated it quite well, while even though Hindu Mahasabha was there since 1915, you could see this book articulating it quite well. But from 1925, Hindu Mahasabha, of course, kind of sharpened the debate within Congress because they were Hindu Mahasabha members in Congress party at that point. Malvi and Rai, many of them. 
and the dual question of dual membership i think the first time before 1978 was in this context in the congress party of course they had to leave the congress when this raging debate happened and this idea of a hindu majority in state within the congress party congress international congress i mean at that point we technically can't call it a congress party but within the international congress was not finding in a subscribers from 1924 till 1952 you see the same debate losing very badly still electorally speaking even though major events had ha happened in between you have 1942 with quit india movement every other congress leader many socialist leaders and communists either getting banned or put in jail or uh, what not many of the provinces very interestingly muslim league and hindu mahasabha coming together and forming coalition governments and the first movement to form to propose a first paper in a government document that we would find of passing a resolution for the partition of the subcontinent was taken in a coalition government that muslim league and hindu mahasabha formed in north west frontier state of uh, that you know is in today's pakistan and of course the riots which followed in 1945 46 47 also forced the congress to take a position and you know it it was more like everyone was in it together by the time it the decision was taken but the debate that we were talking about the majoritarian state versus the contractual nationalism with the formation of the constituent assembly this was this was the losing side i mean there is there was there isn't any more evidence that we require when people who believed in majoritarian nationalism then burning the same constitution that they have used to come to power today since the national flag had more than one color and the national flag had represented something else which they were not trained to believe or conceive it as the idea of india they burned it across the country now they are wrapping themselves in the same national flag that national flag has a different meaning today for many people at least so what does it what does it say the same raging debate that had happened and was a losing side then when they were debating with the founders of this nation when they are debating it with us they are on the winning side of course it hasn't started with our generation or the two or three generations which is sitting there it has been as i see as i saw the naimuddin story has been a decaying story over generations so we didn't get here in one day i think that that thinking that 2014 was some kind of a marker to me doesn't make any sense and going back to 2014 cannot hardly be the vision for this country the vision still has to be i think it allows us the opportunity to think what kind of india do we want and i think we should continue asking those questions we may not get anywhere asking those questions maybe i get you know um, get very far it might look but by just surviving and asking those questions in the spheres that we are in wherever we are in i think we'll still be putting up resistances when we do that and since it's a war in many sense i think just like the way i mean in in the olden times if we were fighting a world war 2 or any war for that matter you have to be at the theater of the war there is no other choice but to be physically present at the theater of war but in modern times where is the theater of war it's in our pockets it's with the phones the internet the misinformation campaign to the abuses that we hear and things which get forwarded and consumed and how it moves us every cell in our cell of our being how well can we check it in our own families in our own social groups in our own universities in our workstations i think it 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 poses this question very quintessentially like what kind of society are we building and i think strategies will evolve i think every society i don't think one should always be bogged down by where will the light come i think there are cracks everywhere in the system i mean this is something that you know 
even with an election like Uttar Pradesh. There are cracks everywhere. The people who have been very laboriously been cultivated as lower OBC hatred against Yadavs or lower Dalits hatred against Jatavs or the main vote bank of BSP. It's not going to, it cannot go very far because it's the same Manusmriti constitution which is ruling, not the constitution of India. Beyond token representation, people will start, I think there will be a day where people will start asking, what does it mean to their lives? If you are on a, on a drug, how long can you continue on the drug? I mean, they can keep injecting the drug on a periodical basis. But I think when a challenge in form of an alternative and an alternate narrative and a vision will come and will build coalitions and will produce leaders who will talk from the podium back to their own community as well, as well as representing them. I think such a complex and huge diverse country will start offering an another, another political system to this majoritarian theocratic state that we are seeing today. And I think in that fight, we are not in some sense insular and India is not just a country which is going through this such a turmoil. Many countries, including the countries whom we believed these debates were sorted and settled, countries who are older than us in democracy, are going through the same challenges. I mean, let's take the United States for that matter. You have, you have seen a president like Trump and that to many Americans even now it's a surprise how did he manage the system and got to be the president of the state, of, of the United States. And they are not going anywhere. I mean, just him losing an election, it gives an impression that the white supremacists, no, they are not done with. They are there, they are at large, they are growing. So I think 21st century, we are living in a time where this, this fight no longer is about the left or the right, or this fight is no longer about the capitalists and the communists. I think to me, this fight is going to be a system for democracy on one side and autocracy on the other. And I think Putin, to me, is no less capitalist than Biden, in many sense, right? So to think in terms like the old Soviet Union narratives that we are used to, you know, some of my f left friends in Kerala are circulating, are sending me Tulsi Gabbard's speeches against Biden. Tulsi Gabbard is uh, one of the US Republican politicians who contested in the primary, in the Democratic primary. And in fact, we, Caravan, had run a big investigation on Tulsi Gabbard's funding because Tulsi Gabbard was propped up as the RS, the main funders of Tulsi Gabbard was the RSS. So Sigabad is the RSS investment in American political system. And so I think this debate is with the information battle that we are facing, it's hard to find the credible information that we are looking for to form our own minds. But I think it will get there eventually is the hope that I am in. It might, it might certainly be a longer haul. I don't think one should expect any reversal of this in a year or two or an election or two. It certainly opens the opportunity for a wider fight and that fight would then definitely has to be something which will not make 2014 or 2004 as referential points, but something that should take back to the debates that we had, the founders of this country had of what kind of India that we want to build. Thank you. Thanks, Vinod. We have a reasonable amount of time for questions and uh, yeah, we have about 25 minutes. So I would say about three sets of questions. I think we can certainly deal with that. And uh, um, I'm just going to start it off and then, you know, is Kranti around? Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, if you have a question, put your hand up and Kranti will come around with the microphone and get maybe three or four questions at one shot. Is that good? I think at the 
within the first 15 minutes of your talk you spoke about how there is a need for a better a more good honest sincere leadership right and and through your speech i mean it it, it was implied i don't think it was said out right but there were two polarizations right one was to speak about how our found, founding fathers were honorable and there were things gandhi ambedkar and nehru agreed on and uh, i'm thinking about how university spaces the to be future leaders talk about this and even otherwise there were things about all these three leaders which are questionable and maybe even answerable right like i don't think ambedkar was particularly very inclusive of muslims he has an entire chapter titled muslims are not our friends uh, gandhi there is debates time and again on caste and gender nehru i i could go on but i suppose what i'm asking you is if we don't have anything to draw from the past the brown man's and enlightenment you spoke of is dead to begin with and i don't quite know exactly who we are supposed to draw on from the past in india and if we need to have a new leadership a new leadership by what you spoke about that would essentially mean we have to invent it ourselves because while i have respect for certain things that our founding fathers did i'm not quite sure if i'm in complete tandem with everything that was said and done so i suppose my question is yeah. for you to elaborate thank you on. that's a very very good question you are absolutely right about three of them a disagreeing with each other on many things b have serious problems when we read them today or even when if we had read them then having said that i think we should approach history and historical figures including ourselves not as this perfect people on earth so there will be evolutions of each one's character and beliefs and construct that they are each one possess but what history will also teach us is that we can always draw the good elements from anybody and when i look back i see a lot of good elements from many of them which i can draw i will debate with history we we should as people encourage those debates and keep it open the same thing that you said about let's say a lot of people try to hide or whitewash over ambedkar's reading on the muslims a lot of gandhians until ambedkar it started emerging in the in 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 the, in the recent past and popularized it of course in the ambedkar circle the debate was very clear from early on but now it has reached popular history where gandhi has been shown as the racist that he was as the casteist that he was nehru's over reliance of a modernity and a belief that a socialist ussr kind of a system of a centralized system as well as not i mean you know he when this question of mandal in some sense we, we know mandal because mandal submitted the report in 70s and then vp singh government picked it up 10 10 years later but the first time the reservation question for other backward classes came when nehru was the prime minister in late 50s and he did not know how to deal with it he told his friends and cabinet colleagues i don't want to deal with it let this be a state subject let the states decide it so he as a clever politician played it very carefully and there were states which has used it quite well at that point and those were states that you can see because we, there is like 70 years of history of the states which has taken the obc course then and the states which has taken it up later state like tamil nadu immediately grabbed the opportunity 1950s you see the backward class communities sort of getting represented in medical institutions and everywhere compare the same yardstick to states which did not start using it like uttar pradesh and mandal came about so 40 years or so which got wasted thanks to whom nehru so i am not saying that we should be blind followers of any of them far from it let there be debates there 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 were people who lived at that point with their strengths and weaknesses 
They're not alive for us to go and ask them, why did you take this decision? Were you politically blind to have taken decisions? Decision? What was your caste formation? We could ask them, we could interrogate them if they were alive. But I think for us, we, are, we have very clear minds for us to understand what to be drawn from each of them. And dump the rest, we don't need to. Some of it will be unfinished debates in history. Let it be. But I think when we speak of modern times, there is a reference point that we could go back and check with them. And that's where I would use them. Because those reference points, all three of them agreed on this point. And we don't want any further confusion on that point, that this is a contractual nationalism where people can eat anything that they want, people can dress in a certain way, people can hang around, and love is not politicized. Families are not politicized in a way that you know, uh, people can't interact and come together as communities. On those areas of contractual nationalism, I find very few points to sort of disagree with three of them. Uh, Vinod, this is a question about the last part of your um, speech, um, where, you know, we were talking about um, democracy, but I think that the Indian democracy, and for that matter, democracy in most of the parts of the world, uh, was a very elitist construct, okay? And uh, most probably, it failed to deliver a real democracy. I mean, it was a democracy mostly for the privileged class. Uh, so the emergence of Mandal and Ayodhya movement in the same moment of history is not a coincidence. It is essentially the Bahujans in various ways reasserting themselves and you know uh, proclaiming the failure of the democratic system to give them the dividends. So uh, uh, do we need to reframe um, and probably accept the failure of democracy to provide them with you know with whatever the egalitarian dream was for. Absolutely. I think uh, you are, you're very right about democracy being a very elitist idea. And I'm a big fan of uh, Thomas More. Thomas More, um, who was killed in the 1600s for writing a thesis like Utopia, uh, where the essence of that is he just envisaged a society where people, everyone could just come and vote and everyone has the right to vote. It looked very alien as an idea for King Henry to accommodate. Of course, he was killed also for a few bunch of other reasons. He was a chancellor there. He opposed uh, you know, uh, some of the personal decisions that Henry had taken. So we, as we know democracy where everyone will get the right to vote, even just that idea sounded very revolutionary in 1600s. And it, it's only about 400 years that we are talking about here. And that also, as early as the, as late as the early 20th century, most of the Western countries were not giving the right for women to vote. It was, there was no universal franchise there. So this was a system which was romantic, utopian. And technically, we pass the test and we can tick the box. And that's why our leaders stand up on the world stage and say that we are the world's largest democracy because we have periodical elections every five years. Everyone has the right to vote and all that, which is all true technically. If any, somebody has gained the system, I don't think that is a problem for the system itself. Because I, when I look around, I don't see many systems which we can adopt. That doesn't mean that we need to be blind followers of political parties or political institutions which has been undemocratic and we have to call them out for that. And that's exactly what happened in the early 90s with Mandel and many others where, you know, I think till today, one of the longest speeches when you go back in the parliament, Indian parliament's debates is the speech that Rajiv Gandhi gave against Mandel. And how idiotic can that be for a party which then was sort of wanting the OBC vote base and this still. And this is something that the RSS had tricked Rajiv to give. And, and where is then the intelligence of the man is a question that we can certainly ask. But then RSS at that, that point in that debate told to get the BJP leaders to go slow and let the Congress fight the fights because it was then a personal fight with VP Singh. But when, if, if I am an OBC uh, educated 
young person living in Uttar Pradesh in some small town and if I had read Rajiv Gandhi's speech the next day in the newspaper, I would be making sure that at least my generation, my children's generation, my grandchildren's generation, I would paint Rajiv Gandhi and the Gandhi family as the, pers as the people who came on the way of getting a certain kind of representation for my people. So for Congress to go and expect OBC vote bank to come back to them, they have to first go back and correct their past. They have to stand up and apologize. They have to articulate their vision better. And traditionally, left parties also have, I mean, in many sense, the caste issue that they could have taken it up. They did not reinvent the left politics for the subcontinent, in the subcontinent, this sort of complex social relationships. It has taken them for a long time. They were debating, wasted a lot of time. But by the time accepted and understood, or started understanding it, it was probably too late. And there were new, new politics like Aam Aadmi Party and others emerging by the time and who could outwardly present something in a capsule format, but internally something else, far from the kind of committed speeches that they give. Let's take three questions at one shot, because I think that way we'll get more efficient. Uh, hi. Um, let me ask you two questions. Uh, the Supreme Court in the past couple of months have uh, stated that uh, uh, it is a matter of concern that uh, uh, not uh, a lot of uh, leaders are coming out of universities. And that is a matter of concern because we do not know what leadership would look like in the next 30 or 40 years. So how do you think with the current regime in power, uh, students and especially, you know, uh, the doctorates, uh, who are doing the doctorates and the masters and what all and what not, uh, should tackle this. Uh, that's first. Uh, that's about the future. Uh, about the recent election that happened, uh, one important factor that I think you missed uh, was uh, the schemes uh, about the pensions, uh, the uh, gas cylinder schemes and all that, uh, that went in. Do you think uh, that uh, the BJP government is a, a right-wing government or, or a left-wing government? Because uh, no, I honestly think that. See, if we take them you know, in a social context, they are more on, a, on the right, uh, right than on the left. And uh, when it comes to the economic front, I think they are more on the left than on the right. So what do you think of that? Thank you. Uh, any more questions? అన్ని ప్రభుత్వాలు అన్నీ కూడా సంక్షేమ పథకాల మీద ఎక్కువ డబ్బులు స్పెండ్ చేస్తున్నాయి కదా అయితే దానివల్ల ప్రజల్ని బానిసలు చేస్తున్నారని నా ఫీలింగు సంక్షేమ పథకాలు అంటే పింఛన్లు ఫ్రీగా ఇవ్వడం కాకుండా కొత్త ఆలోచనలు ఏమైనా చేస్తే బాగుంటుంది అంటే ఆరోగ్యం విద్య దీన్ని మీరు ఏమంటారు దీనికి ఇది మంచి ఆలోచన అంటారా లేదంటే తప్పు అంటారా Governments are now b banking more on uh, doles and uh, he wants to know whether that's a good idea instead of going for um, improving the state of, uh, sta you know, conditions of life like education, health and other things. Politics of dole. Yes. Yeah. Hi, thanks for coming and speaking today. Um, I wanted to know if, in the absence of a credible national opposition party, if there's a role for federalism to take a bigger, uh, you know, a, a bigger role in India for protecting individual rights, freedom of the press, etc., the, the things that can help keep the democracy healthy. Yeah. So I think uh, your question and uh, his question quite quite related in some sense. Uh, yes, in the UP election, for example, I, you know, uh, 
as I must have stated, and that's very true, that the kind of, let's say, spending which has gone in the public rationing in Uttar Pradesh or the PDS has been quite substantial. And this is where it's also sort of very worrying to even know the record of the previous governments that for something as a guarantee like many South Indian states, for example, that you have a very robust public distribution system in the South. Uh, maybe learn from the famines in the past. I don't know, but there is certainly a willingness to do that and maybe most of it is connected to elections and they realize that there is a lot of currency, whether it's the Tamil Nadu politicians, Kerala politicians, Andhra politicians, you see that everywhere. But in the North, especially in states like Uttar Pradesh, for example, for ration, the surety that you needed for to make sure that there is a food on the table, people had to go to the landlord nearby. And that was as recent as just before the pandemic. And the Yogi government, one of the things that they have done is it made sure that there are certain kilograms of grain on the table. And they could go to the PDS and get it. In that sense, not so much a left versus right, I think a right government which has been trying to be welfareist in some sense. And giving a bunch of things that, you know, the governments before them should have, you know, institutionalized that system without any interference of what not. I mean, every government has the right to improvise on that, but now the BJP government and the Yogi government would go down in the family histories of many of those homes as the government which has gotten them the food. Like, you know, Tamil Nadu people say that it was, let's say, um, an MGR uh, who would have gotten midday meals to a level where they felt it was okay to you know, uh, uh, you know, just leave the children for school and they at least come back home with their stomach full, right? So this is part of family histories. People would recall like this is the child who got in this education. And that's then in some sense welfareism go a long way in making investments uh, even as a political narrative. And a government which has called itself socialist, Samajwadi party never made that system there, right? So that, that sense, I think that has played a huge role in getting Yogi the kind of acceptance that he has got in spite of everything else which is done in the society regressively. Uh, I think uh, the free doll system that, I mean, one thing the way media presents this is like freebies giving and people sort of waiting for freebies. I think it's the way that you look at this is a very solid school of economics, Keynesian school that we are talking about. You know, even the the income, the the employment narega, the employment guarantee schemes, or any of the things that you see, it comes out of very strong, well-grounded philosophy in economics, where the state can and should worry about the welfare of its large sections of people. It cannot be things penetrating down, wealth penetrating down all the times waiting for generations for that magic to happen that the economists promise. The state has an active role to play in making sure that there are certain social sec sectors which needs to be protected and given as guaranteed, health being another, education being one, food being one, right, you know. So I think I don't see it as a freebie thing, you know, in that sense. I, I like states which take a very active role in that. And we'll be surprised to see that, you know, even with this narrative that the free marketers would sort of use the media to spread, even with that, the data doesn't get India any way close to the percentage-wise spending in health and education to any of the Western countries. We are still far, far low in the kind of spending that is required. You know, 5%, 6%, 9%, this is the kind of spending that Western democracies do we are spending in lower single digits. One person, one and a half percent, even less than one person. So I think uh, what we are spending certainly is not enough for social security in this country. And how we are spending, when we are spending, you know, all that is debatable. And I think from different states, we have different models. Um, uh, but that's, that's good, actually, is my sense. And your question about uh, federalism. Uh, yes, I think this constitution has built on the guarantee that these diverse people will get to decide most things locally. 
uh, but I think we are seeing a very centralized state and I think decentralization is happening in a far frightening way than Nehru wanted centralization. Uh, and that's very evident with the way the pandemic was handled, for example. Well, health is a state subject, and if they had th left the state to handle it, initially they wanted a national attention, and the, the prime minister would appear on TV, and he would need to be getting that prime time on every single home in the television. But when things started going astray, then he disappeared, and then it would be like a suddenly a state subject. When vaccine had to be produced, then you know, again, the state would put it on the state, uh, the central will put it on the state, that then it becomes state's responsibility. Compensation for COVID victims, again, the center wouldn't give the money, it then becomes the state's responsibility. The 50,000, the, the Supreme Court verdict on that. That many states have gone bankrupt uh, because the center was not giving the money that uh, for COVID deaths. So it's convenient federalism con conversation. When there is trouble, you guys handle it when I can handle things because I see a point of advancing myself, I handle it. Uh, but unfortunately, many states who are, who are in a position to expose it also can't do it because the chief ministers will tell them to go slow because that would, to be in a confrontation position when you are in power in a state with Delhi always is hard because you need those resources from Delhi to come back. The revenue that you collect is collected in a way that you're still dependent on the center for things to be at actually proceeding further, right? So again, one of those issues where I think certainly a lot of debate has to take place still. Uh, we'll take three more questions and uh, then we'll be done with the event. Thank you. Actually, uh, I have one question, but before that, read the concept of federalism. One of the things is that uh, off late, ever since this government has come to power, uh, the governor, role has been mainly to ensure that any kind of attempt at federalism for certain we have seen it in Tamil Nadu we are seeing it, we saw it in Delhi for a long time the governor's role was to sabotage any attempt at uh, you know the state trying to help out you know its populace uh, we saw it in Delhi especially with regard to education however uh, my question uh, is with regard to the subject of uh, health now uh, the past two years the re uh, past two years we have had this pandemic and it was the worst managed pandemic i mean we just managed to come out of it i mean we were lucky enough to manage to come out of it mainly by our own enterprise and you know many of the poor people's enterprise we saw people you know walking miles and distances but at no point i mean since then none of the media none of them have talked about the need for health services public health services this was i mean we used to have it at one point until the 70s it was quite good i mean it wasn't perfect it was quite good but since the 80s and you know with rajiv gandhi then after that pv narsimarao we have slowly dismantled all these public health systems and things like that because it was uh, costing too much money and it uh, many of them saw it as waste now uh, is your magazine or you know any other media outlet trying to bring up these issues uh, I mean, that's the question. Two more? Uh, you made a lot of nice points, you know. I mean, one thing what I liked was like, you know, we shouldn't be just looking back to April 2014, but we should be going far behind. Uh, you know, I would say a long time, long, long time ago when Nehru wrote Brahmanism is the essence of this country in his discovery of India. Why is that we don't discuss this? Brahmanism, Manuvad. I mean, you know, we have the best racist structure in India. Layer over layer that nobody, you know, revolt. It's not black and white like in any other places. And unless that is questioned. You know, I mean, the best thing is, I, I had the best Brahminist justifications, uh, you know, taught to me by leftists in Kerala, the Bhattacharyas and uh, Nambudri parts and people like that. Onam, which is supposed to be a most revolutionary festival, became a Brahmin festival in Kerala or Naya festival in Kerala. I mean, why are we not talking about that? Yeah, I just want to ask. Uh, because I uh, just heard something and I felt like asking this. See, I, we, me and my wife, we were uh, thinking of a very dangerous trend that is emerging. I have a son who goes to a school, uh, you know, he's in third grade. And one day we were discussing about uh, changing his school. And recently happened this thing. 
uh, he overheard us and while he was sleeping at the time actually it was in the morning and he started he woke up crying and we asked him what was the issue he said i don't want to go to a christian school see the dangerous thing is because like as a primary school we never discussed religion in the house or caste or at least we were we tried to be moderately secular in our house but how could a boy i know who, who was even uh, actually we named him so that nobody understands his religion or caste we named him in such a way that uh, you know it doesn't reflect any religion or a caste or even that brahmanical thing won't appear in his name uh, but the school has taught him that he is a hindu so you know you have been very positive and i don't want to be that pessimist around here but i am seeing a very dangerous trend here you know when you can you know uh, i don't think religion anymore exists in the brain it exists in the dna so i'm really worried about it yeah yeah so i think the health question suddenly i thought that covid would probably bring a debate back personally i felt that this was a, this was going to be a challenge to the private healthcare system especially um, uh, the way they have proved themselves how inadequate they were uh, at all levels but unfortunately this has not been a debate at all see i think the time when we could expect media to create a debate has gone uh, the way we understand media's role in this country a it's uh, that it has to be either very powerful like it should be everywhere and those powerful media houses like times of india don't want to get into debates anymore um, or smaller organizations like the caravan we could do stories and and i think i mean we may have done many stories in this regard pointing things to uh, the role of welfare state but the stories where we are more effective are stories which is you know i think you know even in creating public public opinion where we are stone pelters right you with a judge lawyer story or a file story you kind of do a big break and then there is some kind of public attention other medias will try to avoid it but then eventually will be forced to take it up not certainly on a policy thing because often policy it's like you know speaking to uh somebody who's forcefully you know who forcefully shut his ears and i think for that any policy questions to happen in emerge in a society i think often there has to be political voices doing that and the reason why healthcare is not a debate even post pandemic forget about healthcare in fixing the system even the pandemic deaths have not been an issue in the up election like you know i don't know how many of you know the last second wave got so compounded and so badly uh, affected this country because kumbh mela was advanced by one year because the tantric had told them to do so actually this year was supposed to be the kumbh now you know the natural calendar seemed to me uh, the nice time for kum right this year post omicron there is i mean we are all here we have opened up but the tantric to his wisdom thought that was the time to do it and what was the wisdom what is the wisdom done people who traveled in the north up and down attending the kum that that was the hot spot that was the biggest hot spot what the tablikis were accused of the year before the kumbh had done it in a much larger scale the year after right so still even then in up and dead bodies were floating in the ganges we had seen this but why didn't the sp or the congress or the bsp or anybody for that matter make that an issue right that's an important question i think the private healthcare policy thing just to sum it up congress and many of them have believed for long private healthcare is good in the most of the post up boys who emerged as the private health care post you know uh, post up boys were people who were created in that system we had done stories on them you know trehan for example oh. or even cardiologists and many many others who decided in the last 20 years i think we have also gotten into, into a system where the cardiologists are deciding the health care direction on the policy direction in this country why i often ask this question and then the health uh, journalist vidya krishnan gave me the best answer because politicians are in that age they often need a cardiologist by <laughs> next to them 
and they have gotten close to the cardiologists in Delhi. And the cardiologists have been, up, up, you know, even in the pandemic, you need you need an infectious disease person to tell uh, the leaders. And but there is not a single infectious disease person in the top level. And this is we, I think we had a robust infectious disease system, probably one of the best in the world until pandemic came. And this is also the story of how we, we destroyed it. You know, polio, any of those vaccinations that we have taken, how freely and smoothly and effectively did we handle it all these years. Best case study, better than China, better than any populated country, pop more populated country. But this is like that, the problem is that the, the centralization, that the federal question that the friend asked. The emperor decides to take it over, right? Then his cardiologist and the AIMS director become the bigger advisors and not the Pune uh, National uh, in, in Infectious Disease Center or whatever, right? Otherwise, these were things which were getting decided from a Pune lab by scientists. So when you don't trust the specialists with the knowledge that they have possessed over the years. When we use every opportunity as an opportunity for your own sake, we get what we get, right? So uh, the second question was, uh, I forgot the second question. And uh, Brahmanism, why didn't we discuss? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think the caste layers of the society, I, I, I think it, it's increasing. I can see uh, more conversation around caste now than 10 years ago. And that's, I think, a very positive thing. The more people getting politicized over that. But it's not happening in an organized and an organized way around a political narrative that is possible. And I think it's an opportunity, elections like this or Convictions like this, what we learn from each election, that when we keep trusting a leader because a leader was part of a movement which meant something then, is failing us in modern times today, we will go back and ask the fundamental questions. When the plumbing is leaking and when we know that it doesn't get fixed with a quick fix, we know that we got to look at the plumbing in its entirety, right? And I think that might take some time, but that's the time I think that every society has taken to get to a better place. The bias and prejudice that your third grader has taught with, I'm not surprised, I think that's, that's ingrained in the kind of messaging that everyone is used to. And my own children are not free from that. They are as, you know, I was surprised with a kind of a you know, a racial prejudice comment that one of my children made. You know, I didn't get to hear it then, but I, when I got to know that he said something like that, I was surprised. I mean, where is he picking it up? And he's also like your ch child, a third grader or fourth grader. So we are not watching them 24 into say that, see that where it is coming, it is coming, the kind of messaging that's happening, whether it's through games or people, or institutions that they go to, it's coming, it's there, and it's not their fault. And I think all of us, as many of us who are parents, or even in offices, we face this. I think, you know, uh, scolding wouldn't solve the problem, but I think, you know, gradual explanation. And I think many of us have also been in those places, I think. I mean, I, I personally have. I mean, maybe some words that you might use in, in your language that is politically not appropriate. So, you, you know, all of us evolve. I think that understanding and politics should get evolved. I think th that, uh, to me, change also will happen with that empathy that the other person might be making the mistake without knowing it. And calling it out or correcting is with the hope that I'm not losing that person, but I'm getting that person in the same boat for a longer journey. I think that's what I think we'll have to do. So, Vinod, I'm going to bring you back to two very different moments in your talk as the last question that uh, just use it as a way to sum it up in terms of what I think are some of the big takeaways. You kind of outlined or at least in a kind of a, a telescopic fashion uh, talked about contractual nationalism and at another point you talked about how identity politics or caste leaders coming from specific communities have to not only represent the community to the outside world, but also turn back and talk to their community slash uh, groups. How do you connect that notion of contractual nationalism to this kind of new leadership that needs to do a conversation in both directions? Very challenging question because I think you need to wear the hat of a political theorist. Uh, 
I think it's possible because what we are asking in practical sense is it's not a lot, right? But when you when you accept that it's been different journeys that all of us have taken, and that would mean your caste history or community history or regional history or language history or food history or dress history or love history or what not, contracts. And when you recognize that all of us have taken those routes, uh, acknowledging that itself is then part of the contract, then you are waiting, f you are okay to sort of make amends in your own way of sort of judging or not judging and uh, respecting or not respecting, so there is clearly a choice there to be drawn. The second part of how do you sort of get the leaders to talk, I mean, it's, it's when you get, I think, people to, I mean, a new leadership that I see is the kind of leadership, and of course it might sound utopian, and I think every idea in that sense, democracy has Thomas More, when he was proposing, and he, he was not confident enough to call it like something else, so he knew that it was utopian, so he called this book also Utopia. But I think that was, in t today's time, the most practical vision, in many sense, I think Marx came 200 years after him, or many other thinkers at that time. So I think when we suggest or propose a kind of leadership that might be a person who is you know, the third grader who is sitting there, that might be the person who is like in college or university now, or maybe an elder person, like sometimes, you know, many countries leadership, political leadership is emerging very late also, uh, who have been revolutionary, 70s, any age group, any place, I think they will have that big heart and bunch of people who will have that big heart to work towards an India which will be value-based as opposed to an ideological frame that all of us are sort of so used to. Uh, because I think that's where caste is primarily a value-based repressive idea. And a value-based repressive idea, to my understanding, has to be challenged by another value-based emancipatory idea. Terrific. Thank you so much, Vinod. What a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. and. Uh, once again, you know, this is Lama Khan coming back after two years. Um, thank you all for being here. And so thank you so much for being here. Chai and Samosa, as I said, Roj Kwa Khode or Roj Pani Pia is behind you. So feel free. Thank you so much. One more thing, one more thing. I have to give him the gift. Oh, okay. This is a token of Lama Khan that we'd like you to have. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.